Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, LGBTQIA plus family building. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few quick items about today's event. First, all physicians in attendance today will receive an AMA PRA category one credit and all other providers will receive a certificate of completion for one contact hour credit. The certificate will be emailed to you by Harvard around midsummer. Additionally, we encourage you to submit questions to Dr. Resikova using question, the questions section of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Nina Resikova is a reproductive endocrinologist at Boston IVF and a member of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and the New England Fertility Society. Her research interests include the application of cost-effectiveness studies in medicine, studying the RNA profile of the developing embryo, and LGBTQIA fam plus family building. Dr. Resikova sees a wide spectrum of fertility patients, including those who would like to explore fertility options and fertility preservation. She has a special interest in caring for the LGBTQIA plus patient population. Her novel research examining transgender fertility preservation outcomes has been published in peer reviewed journals, presented at national meetings and received significant interest from the press. All right, we're ready to get started. I'm gonna pass it over to you, Dr. Risikova. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and hi everyone. Um, Nina Rasikova, uh, you're joining me in my office and we're dealing with, <laughs> with some darkness. So I hope you don't mind. It's a bright sunny day outside. Just uh, this webcam is, looks a little bit dark, but um, thanks for joining in. Um, uh, just for all of UIC patients at the Quincy Center and also see patients um, in the North Chelmsford location as well. So both south and north of the city. So let me know if I can uh, be of help. Uh, or if we have any mutual patients um, and you have any questions, um, I'd love to connect. And particularly if you have any questions about uh, patient referrals, happy to help with that. So today our topic is LGBTQ plus family building. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of disclosures for me here should not affect our uh, discussion today. And here are objectives for today. Um, we're going to learn more about the various treatment options available for LGBTQ individuals and couples. Um, I'm going to review our 2019 study looking at uh, transgender fertility preservation and transgender family building. And um, also just to review patient management and clinical recommendations. And this talk is, you know, intentionally pretty comprehensive um, to address sort of the full spectrum of, of the population. Um, and please, if I, you know, don't address any specific questions that you have, um, definitely ask in the question and answer, um, or uh, feel free to email me with any more specific or more patient-directed questions. I'd like to start by kind of defining the, the scope of, of the community. Um, so, you know, we're, we're talking about um, LGBTQ+, um, sometimes referred to as LGBTQIA+, um, in order to add um, to the lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, and transgender, add queer, intersex, and asexual to the basic term. This term's evolving over time, so it's important to know that terminology around this topic is constantly evolving, and um, so our, our sort of as the culture evolves and our understanding evolves, um, you know, we we, may, we need to be flexible. Um, this represents about four and a half percent of adult Americans, um, and slightly uh, biased towards um, uh, female assigned sex of birth, um, slightly more. Um, and then in terms of uh, the transgender population specifically, one of the better studies looking at this, um, which actually Harvard and, and um, the Fenway contributed to was a 2016 survey by the Williams Institute, where about 0.6% of the US adults identify as transgender. Um, this percentage is slightly higher when we're looking at the um, uh, the, the teen population as well, the adolescent population, and the figures are also higher if you do um, uh, anonymous kind of survey-based reporting. Um, internationally, um, the LGBTQ plus community encompasses uh, between one and seven percent of adults, and that's of course based on you know how progressive the culture is and how um, you know accommodating uh, the culture is for the community. 
So this is the survey um, that was done by the Williams Institute looking at um, also, again, LGBTQ prevalence across the country. And these dark blue um, maps reflect um, where the, there's a higher density of population identifying as LGBTQ+. And so um, you can not not unpredictably, uh, the kind of the coasts are a little bit more represented, um, and then the middle portion of the country is slightly less at uh, below 3.7%. Um, in our community, uh, now thinking about uh, uh, coming from the perspective of a fertility center, um, a lot of our patients, is this sort of a higher density or higher concentration of patients who identify as LGBTQ+, because they need a partner in the process of family building. And so, um, you know, we, we really pride ourselves on this because we've been caring for the LGBTQ population since our inception as a clinic, um, and we've really seen a lot of growth in this area. So um, I'll share some figures with you, but it's um, just, just shy of about 10% of our patient population um, are in the LGBTQ plus community. So what are the needs of this community? Um, well, obviously, just like um, any other medical care, um, the need for respect as an individual, um, recognition of their, their preferences, and then also recognition of their um, relationship status as well. Um, use of correct pronouns and terminology, so making sure that we're actively um, asking or addressing um, their you know, preferred pronouns. And they really need availability of procedures, you know, so they need a clinic that's going to partner with them in the process of family building and be able to offer all procedures, whether it be insemination, whether it be um, IVF treatment, whether it be surrogacy, you know, uh, third party reproduction. Um, and I think it's really important for all patients, but you know, particularly in this community, to review all of the available treatment options, and then um, come to kind of a kind of a shared decision-making model, uh, because I think patients feel that um, if they don't know all of their options coming into treatment, um, they may feel misguided. So sometimes you have to think outside of the box because we have to think about what organs are available um, to facilitate their desired goals. And sometimes both partners take a very active role in the process. So we'll be reviewing some of those, um, some of those kinds of treatments today. So we will talk a little bit about fertility, mostly about fertility treatment, but also some to some degree about fertility preservation. So actually um, preserving gametes, um, eggs or sperm for, for future treatment. Um, and today we will address um, lesbian patients, gay patients, transgender patients, and also patients who are non-binary. So the background of this talk is really that there is actually really a deficiency in, um, in studies specifically addressing the LGBTQ population when it comes to fertility care. Um, a lot of the treatment options and the treatment considerations are, are, are actually based on, you know, responses and typical success rates for heterosexual couples. And, you know, we need to do better. And there's, this has been addressed in literature that there is kind of a void, a void of data. And we at Boston IVF are working hard to help address that void um, because we have a lot of patients, you know, who identify as LGBTQ and we have a lot of excellent data. So we're hoping to, to kind of change that over time. But even as recently as 2015, there was a study that showed how little <laughs> studies there were um, in reporting outcomes, particularly for um, lesbian patients looking at donor insemination. And at that point, there were basically three larger studies looking at outcomes for lesbian patients and one study looking at male outcomes. So not enough. Um, but even if you just do a simple PubMed search looking at LGBTQ fertility, you will know that there are a much higher density of publications um, ranging from right around that time, 2015, and, and, and really rising through 2021, 2022. So there's definitely people who are really you know, passionate about reversing those trends. Um, here you can see our trends for our patient care. And what we're looking at here is the um, increasing um, trend for more treatment by same-sex couples. So as I shared with you, we're, we're getting close to 10% of our overall treatment cycles um, being by um, same-sex uh, couples. And so, you know, that has risen and you, you find that that sort of sharper rise was really since about 2022. So really in the last 10 years, we've, um, 
uh, increased, we've seen an increased demand for these services. So 2012 to 2022, and that's really when we're starting to see kind of the, the data rich representation. So let's start with reviewing treatment options for uh, lesbian or same sex female relationships. Um, one of the forefront treatment options um, for uh, couples presenting for care is insemination with donor sperm. And this can be done in multiple ways. I mean, we, we do see patients who are doing home-based treatments, um, which is typically called a, a vaginal or intracervical insemination. Um, but we do see higher success rates with in-clinic or um, therapeutic donor insemination or intrauterine insemination. So it is not uncommon for couples to kind of try different approaches and particularly to have tried a couple of rounds at home before presenting to the fertility clinic. But it is really imperative if your patients are considering doing that, that they have a fertility evaluation beforehand or at least understand the pros and cons of that. Because I have unfortunately seen so many tough stories of patients where they have um, started their journey and in some cases done as many as 14 insemination cycles, you know, at, at home or with a, a, a donor that they're paying or uh, even a, a donor that they know personally. Um, and there's a clear anatomic abnormality that would prevent them from having a good chance of success or, uh, you know, cycle-based irregularity like PCOS that really hasn't been fully addressed. And it, you know, it, it really hurts when you see that somebody has been trying this pathway with, with no success and really limited potential success. So fertility evaluation is really, really critical. Um, and, you know, that could be performed by you or it could be performed by Boston IVF, but a fallopian tube, tube evaluation, HSG, is, is, really, um, is really helpful to understand that they do have some potential of success. Um, generally, for patients who are under 35 years old, um, we're recommending six cycles of insemination in the office setting, and the insurers mostly agree with this as well, um, in that if the patient is not successful after six rounds of insemination, office-based insemination, then um, they will be eligible for IVF coverage. And there's, a, again, a little bit of variability. There's a lot of new insurance plans coming in that have slightly different um, policies, but, um, but that's, that's what we're generally seeing. And I think that's very fair because the chance of success beyond the sixth cycle um, is relatively poor. So going from cycle number seven to cycle number 12 gives you a much more limited chance of success than cycle number one through cycle number six. Now, if a patient is of advanced maternal age, so greater than 35 years old, um, most of the insurers in Massachusetts are um, allowing or permitting IVF coverage after the completion of three or six insemination cycles. And that's acknowledging that the success rate per cycle is a little bit lower um, once the age advances through her late 30s. And so it, it absolutely makes sense to consider a more aggressive form of treatment like IVF earlier. Um, most insurances are not recognizing home in inseminations, kind of another reason to present to the fertility clinic earlier in the journey so that more of those efforts and more of the you know, out-of-pocket costs for the patient, like purchasing the donor sperm, um, are recognized um, and um, she's eligible for services and coverage at an earlier point. Now, of course, these IUI cycles can be monitored or unmonitored, so involving ultrasound and blood work um, or not, um, and they can be medicated or unmedicated. Most of the literature shows us that it's not wise to start treatment with a medicated cycle, um, with like Clomid or Letrozole, for example, um, because it un unfairly increases the risk of multiple pregnancy without significantly affecting the, um, the total outcome or the total success rates. So if the cycles are regular, usually we prefer a natural cycle. Um, but of course, if there's any concern for PCOS or other ovulatory disturbance, then it may make sense to initiate treatment with Clomid. Um, so looking at some data, um, one of the original studies that was published in this area looking at donor insemination um, was actually published back in 2000. And as of the 2015 publication that showed the deficiency of, of reporting, this is one of the better studies, so I'll share it with you. Um, 
they had performed as a part of the study um, 675 cycles in single women and 139 cycles in lesbian couples. And the same-sex female patients were a little bit younger at the initiation of treatment, so bear that in mind. They were about 34, as opposed to the single women who were about 38. And correspondingly, the clinical pregnancy rates were lower in single women, likely secondary to age, about 36%, over 57% in lesbian couples. And the cumulative pregnancy rates correspondingly were higher for lesbian couples as well, 70% um, over six cycles. As we may expect, the miscarriage rate was also higher in single women um, who were an average 38 years old um, than in same-sex female couples where it was about 15%. So this starts to give us some idea of how successful we can expect uh, people to be after completion of a sort of a, a certain cycle number. And as you can see, the pregnancy rate after the six cycles corresponds roughly to a lot of um, the covered terms of the, of the Massachusetts mandate. And so you can see that not everyone will be successful, even if they're starting you know, before advanced maternal age. So there's definitely a role for IVF treatment um, for, for lesbian patients as well. A newer study, uh, fortunately, we got a better study that was published out of uh, the Bay Area in Fertility and Sterility in 2021. And they looked at I IUI cycles over a period of about 10 years. Um, they actually had a very large number of IUI cycles, over 11,000, but just 393 were in same-sex female, female couples using donor sperm. Interestingly, the average age was very well matched across the group. So now uh, folks were starting around 30, 36, um, and that was, that was the same. So for lesbian patients, the positive pregnancy rate was 14%, 14.8% per cycle, live birth rate of 10%, and miscarriage rate of 15%. Um, now, the heterosexual women had a positive pregnancy rate of 12%. Live birth rate was lower at 8% and a higher miscarriage rate of 23%. So they did some fancy statistics um, uh, with uh, generalized estimating equations and logistic re regression. And the lesbian group did have a higher odds of clinical pregnancy rate compared to um, the heterosexual, uh, the, the women in heterosexual relationships, um, demonstrating an overall higher pregnancy success for the lesbian group, which, which you, you might actually expect because there's uh, going to be a lower rate of, of pre existing infertility in this group. So that thus gives us a little bit more data. Um, from um, from this from these charts, you can also see the overall cumulative pregnancy rate and then the cumulative live birth rate. And what we see here is, is that the rates are not as high, you know, as we might expect. So the success rate's about um, 40 to 45 percent for clinical pregnancy rate. And then the success rates for ongoing pregnancy rate um, was about 35 percent. And on average, the lesbian patients completed about three and a half cycles of insemination, and the heterosexual patients completed just a little bit less, about three cycles. So they likely had an entry point and potentially also treatment coverage for IVF treatment. And um, the Bay Area has a lot of tech companies supplying a lot of really good um, insurance options for patients. And so they likely, their decision making to move on to the next step was likely influenced not only by their age, you know, prior success or lack thereof, but also potentially insurance coverage. Um, and so for about um, 65, about two thirds of this population, they then moved on to another step to, for their family building. Looking at our data, just to give you a comparable, um, we do have sort of a similar um, cumulative pregnancy rate um, over the course of multiple cycles. Potentially, again, influenced by the mandate, we have more patients completing um, further treatment cycles beyond six or more. And the success rate is actually quite comparable to the Bay Area study at about 42, 43%. Um, and our average age is, is slightly lower than, than was seen in their study. Um, so we do have some additional uh, data about the age distribution. And certainly, if you're starting treatment under age 35, the success rates are much higher. So, um, so that's, a, that's a great way to, to be and treat them. A couple of notes on donor insemination, and I'm, I'm trying to give you up to the minute data because this, this does change over time, um, particularly about costs. Um, average cost of a vial of sperm are about $800 to $1,000 uh, per vial, 
and you typically use one vial per treatment cycle unless patients are interested in using a double insemination strategy, which effectively doubles the cost. Um, at Boston IVF, the average cost of the insemination, depending on if you're doing monitoring or not doing monitoring, can range between $500 and $1,200 per cycle. Um, and then most insurers outside of Blue Cross, Blue Cross actually is very encompassing, but um, some, most insurers don't cover the cost of the insemination unless there's an underlying infertility diagnosis. Um, for couples who are using an anonymous sperm donor, they can basically have sperm shipped you know, in a matter of days. Um, whereas if they're working with a sort of a known sperm donor, um, the timeline can take quite a long time. And that timeline usually is about six months because they do have to quarantine the sperm. Um, and that that's, you know, expensive uh, and, and challenging my time because this quarantine process is about six months. So usually working with an, an unknown or, uh, you know, previously called anonymous sperm donor is, is quite a bit faster. So when there's any concern for impending uh, diminished ovarian reserve or fertility issues, I generally advise patients to, um, to go with an anonymous donor. The question always comes is, do we do one insemination per cycle or do we think about doing two? Um, this was addressed in a study that was published in 2019 and they had a ton of IUI cycles in the study, over 20,000, and um, same-sex female couples were about 7% of the population represented. And you can see that there's a slightly higher but non-statistically significant success rate for um, uh, doing two IUIs, 17% per cycle versus 15% per cycle with one IUI, not statistically significant, and again, typically doubling the cost of treatment. Um, so in my opinion, it's not, it's not wise to initiate with this uh, uh, approach, but it may be appropriate for a sort of a closure cycle before moving on to something that's much more invasive and potentially much more costly, like IVF treatment. So what about IVF success rates? Um, one of the better studies looking at this is, is, is still actually a little dated, looking at data from 2014. This is a study out of Northern Europe. Um, and the success rate they found that in fresh IVF cycles, actually um, lesbian patients had slightly lower success rates than um, heterosexual couples, but it kind of evened out when you did a frozen thawed transfer. And the cumulative success rate was actually quite good for fertility treatment after the completion of two cycles, um, so about 63 to 64%. So we similarly see very good success rates um, at Boston IVF. Uh, in fact, we've started to look at some of the data and the success rates are higher. Um, and, and so IVF definitely, there's a, a, huge, a huge role for it in some cases. You know, if we identify a tubal factor on the HSG, you know, IVF will actually be the preferred starting treatment option. And so it's important, again, for that fertility evaluation to take place um, before making a decision on, on the best way to um, go forward with family building. One other treatment that you've probably started to see with a little bit more frequency for your patients is partner-assisted reproduction um, or reciprocal IVF, as it's often called in publication. Um, there's also another term for it, which um, I think personally is probably a little outdated. Um, it doesn't reflect the full spectrum of the population that's using it, um, but shared motherhood IVF. There's some publications out of the UK looking at that, um, that, that, that nomenclature. And it's basically a process where one partner undergoes ovarian stimulation for egg retrieval, and then the second partner undergoes preparation of the uterine lining to actually receive the embryo for transfer. And what's neat about this is it can be coordinated in one cycle, so it can be done at the very same time, and we can align the cycles with a high chance of uh, accuracy, or it can be done over the span of one to two months. And particularly when we're the, the couples or the patients that we're seeing sort of separating it out are patients who are entering um, at an, a later age point, um, advanced maternal age, where they may seek to do genetic testing of the embryos. So we understand a little bit more about the genetic potential of the embryos and the risk of downs and other associated genetic issues. Um, so in those cases, we, we separate it out. Uh, obviously, um, psychologically, there's an, a 
uh, tremendous opportunity for the involvement of both partners. Um, and, uh, and, and it's typically a lot more expensive than insemination, but also very, very effective. Um, there are more, as I mentioned to you, some of the tech companies are starting to offer insurance coverage for this approach. They're not sort of biasing the availability of treatment options. And then um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, there's some individual policies that do have a rider available for reciprocal IVF. Um, in some cases, it's really our only option for lesbian couples if there's some uh, anatomic elements that are affecting their, their chances of reproduction. And so um, in some cases, a partner can serve essentially as um, the uh, oocyte donor um, uh, for, for her wife uh, pursuing treatment. So um, it's, 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 really, it's really an amazing uh, technique. It's not for everybody, um, but patients usually have a very strong idea of whether they're they envision this as part of their family building future. And this is just a, a little um, just an, um, pictorial overview. The success rates, um, which we're actually looking into also, um, recently published 2017, looking at a UK clinic, um, 172 cycles over six years. Um, they actually had, you can see, a fairly high rate of twins. <laughs> um, they very keenly mentioned this in their paper that the twin rate was quite a bit decreased over time as they started preferentially doing single embryo transfer as the quality of their laboratory um, uh, became improved. I can tell you with Boston IVF, we are almost exclusively doing single embryo transfer, particularly um, with this type of treatment. Um, and the cycle, the, the success rates are very good. So most patients who initiate on this journey will, will be successful over time. Of course, it's important to know that donor egg treatment and surrogacy or third-party reproduction are also available for lesbian couples. I'm sure they need it. All right, so switching gears a little bit. So now same-sex male couples or gay couples. We know uh, in, in almost all cases, these guys have sperm. You know, there's in many cases, two, you know, two willing um, uh, folks seeking to be genetic parents. In some cases, they have a very strong preference for one to be a genetic parent. Um, but they are missing eggs and they're missing um, a uterus. <laughs> so we do need to engage um, an egg donor and a gestational carrier um, in order to help them build their families. And these folks can be either um, known known to them, um, so potentially you know sister, cousin, close friend, uh, co-worker, or they can be anonymous to them. But what is really important to know is that uh, we're really trying to get away from this sort of anonymous idea because with the evolution of 23andMe, Ancestry.com, all these sort of genetic testing platforms are widely available. Um, we've all heard the stories of folks being able to delineate, you know, their 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 family and figure out who their family members are from a genetic source. And so, um, truly, we we're, we're switching more towards known or not known um, because in some cases there's you know a very strong relationship that's formed through the process of donation I, I donation or surrogacy as well typically an agency is involved with the recruitment um, of egg donors or gestational carriers or surrogates um, and there's a lot of uh, legal oversight so um, patients will need to work with a reproductive attorney to help assist with the process um, extensive social work evaluation is needed as well and when we're looking at the egg donation piece, um, it can be somebody who essentially will, will, will do a cycle on the couple's behalf, or it can be um, eggs that are already uh, created that are coming from an egg bank, um, where an egg donor, typically a young woman in her 20s or early 30s, has already gone through a treatment cycle, and then her eggs have been sort of parsed out into smaller egg lots. Um, and that would be the, the typical way that the frozen donor egg banks work. And as I shared with you, and in my experience, both men often wish to be biological parents, but in some cases, they there there's not a particular um, desire, and so we'll work with folks depending on what their goals are. A surrogacy can be accomplished through multiple ways. Um, there's traditional sur surrogacy and gestational surrogacy. Um, traditional surrogacy means that um, the eggs. Um, are going to be coming from the same person that is going to be carrying the pregnancy. There are not uh, a lot of legal protections in place 
Um, and there's a really strong push against um, using traditional surrogacy in the United States. It is still practiced um, rarely in some states and some clinics, but it's very risky to um, the intended parents. Um, and so most of the surrogacy is practiced in the United States is through gestational surrogacy, um, where the egg donor and the person carrying the pregnancy are not the same. Okay. There are a lot of variations in the laws um, in different states. So um, it is important for um, the intended parents to work closely with a reproductive attorney to give them some guidance. On this particular um, map, you can see that um, there are some states that are very favorable to surrogacy. So that includes um, much of New England. You'll notice that um, Massachusetts is not yet in dark green, though I just participated in um, a panel that would hopefully get us a little bit closer to having better parentage laws in Massachusetts, such as those in Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. So we're a little bit behind, but we're trying to get there. And also the West Coast is very favorable to um, surrogacy as well. And the re remainder of the country, um, with the exception of a few states, has um, you know, some protections in place, generally favorable, and there's only a few states that they would avoid um, surrogacy in, Michigan, um, Nevada, um, and then um, in Louisiana. So, you know, so the important thing to know about this is that, I'm sorry, that's Nebraska, not Nevada. Uh, New York actually just recently changed in this, in their perspective, and they had some really good laws that were passed into effect in 2020, 2021, actually during the pandemic. So this is, this is a, a situation in flux. It, it definitely can change over time, and, and some states become more friendly over time as well. The success, success rates with surrogacy are generally very high. So we're usually expecting about a 70% success rate per transfer. And the vast majority of these, um, of these couples seek single embryo transfers, transferring back one embryo. So we're, we're typically talking about singleton gestations as well. Um, most couples will be pregnant on their first or second embryo transfer. Treatment is costly, um, not even so much the fertility end, but the, um, the legal fees and the recruiting fees um, and then compensation to the surrogate as well. So um, as a general, and this is very general, so I don't want you, you guys to you know, quote this to your patients necessarily, but just to give you some perspective, usually we're talking about you know, $100,000 to $150,000 all in for, um, for a pregnancy journey. So it is not cheap um, and there's a lot of considerations. Um, to be made, including selection of the right center to work with that's going to be sensitive to the cost and um, ultimately the right um, agency to help help you on your way. Um, this is something that's probably going to be implied, but you know it has been studied looking at the well-being of gay fathers with children born through surrogacy and comparing to heterosexual parents and lesbian mother families. And as we would intuitively expect, um, there are no significant family type differences in actually in parental stress, um, relationship satisfaction. So the the sort of well-being of, of parents is, is quite similar across the board um, because we're all going through this this same stuff, so the, the children uh, fare, fare very well as well. Um, now, lastly, that brings me to our transgender patient population, and this is really where um, we have we have definitely innovated um, in, in publications. So firstly, I want to share with you some of our patient volume over time. Um, these are patients who identify as transgender who are presented for care in some capacity um, over the course of the last eight eight to nine years. Um, 2017, you can see we didn't have a full data capture. We kind of changed um, uh, data collection. Uh, so it's a little bit a little bit off there, it was skewed. And this was updated as of fall of 2021. But you can see that there's really been um, kind of a, a ramping, ramping up transgender patient volume. Um, and we um, have um, really enjoyed caring for this patient population and, and really, I think, innovating and, and pioneering in this area of care. So for patients who are assigned male at birth and are transitioning to a female role, um, sperm can be obtained through multiple ways. 
Um, it can be performed by ejaculation, which as you can imagine can be quite dysphoric for some individuals. So surgical retrieval of sperm can also be performed or in some cases a procedure called electroejaculation or vibratory stimulation, which can be done in the setting of a urologist office, sometimes under sedation. Um, for those who have been on gender affirming hormones, um, so we're talking about estrogen and, and androgen blockers, um, typically they do need several months off those to collect a sperm sample. So it's wise to bank sperm before um, undergoing hormonal transition if possible. We do know from several studies that seem to be consistent that sperm quality may be affected by prolonged estrogen, but most folks who come off estrogen do have resumption of sperm production. So they do form sperm again, even if they've been on prolonged, we're talking about years and years of estrogen administration. And if they don't have good sperm production, it is possible to consider surgical means of obtaining sperm as well. Um, if they have a female partner, um, a partner with a u or a partner with a uterus, um, they can uh, consider intercourse um, or insemination with fresh or frozen thawed sperm. IVF, if the sperm quality is compromised, um, uh, depending on the sperm parameters. If they have a partner with testes, um, then of course surrogacy with egg donation is an option or of course alternative forms of family building, um, fostering adoption, et cetera. So most of our work really has been, um, most of our studies and our work has been with assigned patients who are assigned female at birth. And um, this is, uh, it's not, not so much news anymore, but uh, in, you know, in the early, early uh, to mid 2000s, this was, um, you know, a huge, huge story is Thomas Beatty um, was on the cover of People magazine for um, being one of the first uh, men to carry a baby. And so this is somebody who was um, uh, assigned female at birth, you know, who had then gone through gender affirming treatment um, with uh, prolonged uh, testosterone administration and then was ultimately able to conceive. Um, and it was, you know, it was a big, it was a big splash, a big story. Um, interestingly, some of my colleagues said that they had treated patients um, and had uh, transgender men carrying pregnancies before. It just wasn't as sensational, I guess. So this person was very much willing to share their story. Um, there's several options for transgender individuals, um, you know, in, in unless they've had a uh, gender confirming surgery, there's typically oocytes available, either through stimulation of the ovaries from uh, fertility preservation, or um, in some cases, you know, if they've had a gender affirming treatment, um, surgery, and they've had their ovaries removed from potentially from a cisgender female partner. Uh, they can consider oocyte cryopreservation, so egg freezing. Also, it is possible to actually preserve the ovarian tissue itself, um, potentially when they're having their uh, bilateral salpingoforectomy or hysterectomy or both. Um, so that can be done as well, um, but the number of clinics that have um, experience with that is, is more limited. And the experimental, uh, experimental label just got lifted off ovarian tissue a cryopreservation a short while ago. So um, I would say there's a lot more data available for egg freezing. They can certainly choose to carry pregnancy themselves. Um, there's some very affirming studies that suggest that most trans men coming off testosterone will have a period within three months and have very good um, return to pregnancy rate. Um, and of course, a partner or surrogate may also carry the pregnancy. Some really important specifics for the um, trans men community in particular is uh, that they may have vaginal atrophy from long-term testosterone use. So vaginal ultrasounds can be very uncomfortable. And so it is actually very possible for us to offer trans abdominal ultrasounds for evaluation for monitoring. And there are the options of not inducing immenses prior to treatment. Having uh, a menstrual cycle, particularly when they have not had a period for many years, can be very, very dysphoric. Um, so there are strategies to um, reduce the likelihood of experiencing menses, or at least experiencing multiple menses during the course of treatment. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we also consider is, you know, like less frequent or more flexible monitoring. And uh, this is where really rapport with their individual provider is.
because um, this is so so key and so important. So um, this is a community that I really enjoy working with, and and I think. Um, hearing that these are options, you know, during uh, at the beginning of the journey is really important uh, for transgender men because I think it can just make the process a lot, a lot smoother knowing that we are actively doing things to make the process easier for them. So in the US, about 0.3 to 2% of individuals um, identify as transgender. And we know uh, from some studies I'll share with you that many transgender men have an interest in family building. Um, this is a study that was published in 2011 out of a group in Belgium, and um, this is looking at the reproductive desire uh, for trans men to, um, to have children. And this is a really interesting perspective. Um, this was from their, um, uh, their gender care center, and actually all these folks had already undergone gender affirming surgery. So this is essentially their retrospective wishes. And most were in a relationship, about two thirds were in a relationship, about one out of five had children. And um, about half reported a desire to have children. And interestingly, they really looked at the element of regret here. If they had had the option to freeze gametes, to freeze eggs, had that option been available, greater than one third of patients would have really considered that. And you may remember that egg freezing really came to more general acceptance in about 2012. And so um, it became more widely available. The technology was really much more similar to that of embryo freezing. So these folks really didn't have good options in the time span that they were, that they were being cared for. So this really highlights how important it is to fully counsel um, patients, transgender patients, before they start their transition about their, their fertility preservation options. Um, a newer study actually out of um, a group also in Belgium um, that was published in Fertility and Sterility in 2020 um, looked at particularly here um, uh, transgender men who were assigned female at birth um, and then also non-binary people as well. Um, and their results show that about 39% had a current or future parental desire. Um, and this actually didn't differ based on non-conforming status or transgender men. And just 9% of those individuals had cryopreserved reproductive cells or tissue. And what's really notable about this group is um, in Northern European countries, they really have excellent excellent coverage um, to, uh, for fertility treatments. And to the extent, I have a, a colleague that I did some research with in Belgium, to the extent where they'll actually put you up in a hotel room if you live too far away from the fertility center for a couple of weeks. So um, they try to break down as many barriers as possible. So it's really interesting that this population, um, uh, only about 9% have chosen to go forward. And there's, of course, um, several barriers that may, may still exist, even if the financial aspect is not there. So um, I'm gonna, that brings us to our um, Boston IVF study, um, one of the landmark studies that we uh, published in 2019, assisted reproductive technology outcomes, so ART outcomes in female to male transgender patients and a comparison to cisgender patients. Um, and we really thought this was a new frontier in reproductive medicine. So this was, um, accomplished through an, a database search of our electronic medical record and was approved by the VI IRB. And you really just have to identify as a transgender man going through treatment to be included. So um, we pulled data um, up until about 2018, um, and we had 53 patients who presented for consultation, about half of those chose to undergo treatment. So this sort of conversion rate was actually Quite high after patients were um, introduced to their options. A wide spectrum of ages. Um, average age is about 27, but the age span was from 14 to 39. And we had at that time about 29 cycles completed by 26 patients. Most of these were for egg freezing, but you can see that there's some patients who underwent IVF with embryo freezing, embryo prior preservation, and, and some who actually went IVF, uh, underwent IVF with the intent of embryo transfer. The average time folks have been on testosterone was close to four years, and the average time they had been off testosterone before pursuing treatment was about four months. So to highlight some of our results, um, when we looked at all patients, um, the number of eggs that were harvested was about 25. 
um, um, sorry, the number of eggs was, was 19. Let me get I get to this part. The number of eggs that were retrieved in the patient in the in the cluster of patients who were just doing egg freezing was 22, a little bit higher. It was a younger population, and then for patients who were seeking to make embryos or did IVF with the intent of embryo transfer, slightly lower number of eggs, but still a very good number of eggs relative to our general patient population. Um, and um, you know that varied according to the age age of entry. So for our patients who were just doing egg freezing, they were young, 25 on average, and they got the highest number of eggs. But we really wanted to understand how does this compare to our cisgender patients who are going through treatment um, when we match for some of the most important criteria that predict IVF success rates, age, body mass index, and ovarian reserve or AMH. So interestingly, for cisgender patients, which we matched kind of five to one, we found that um, the, the average number of eggs is 14. And those um, transgender patients who had had androgen exposure, so who had been on um, testosterone for either a short period or a longer period, average of four years, the number of eggs that were retrieved for those transgender individuals was actually higher. It was not statistically significant, so, um, but it was a little bit higher. So that led us to believe that um, it's, uh, androgen exposure is likely not um, having any significant adverse effect on the ovarian environment. The strengths is that this was really the first study of its kind, and it offered also a descriptive approach so that folks who are caring for individuals in areas that aren't as high density for the transgender population could have a better understanding of how to provide care, how to structure the, the cycle, and feel more comfortable offering the service. The limitations, of course, is still a relatively small number of patients. Um, the matching approach was limited by the available data, and not all patients that we included had actually started on testosterone yet. They were at different phases in their transition. Some further publications since 2019 have documented similar supportive findings. And I do think it's important to know that there have since been case reports, as well as, um, you know, I've discussed with, you know, my colleagues who work in other uh, areas of higher density, that um, there are trans men who have undergone ovarian stimulation with good results without actually coming off testosterone. So it may be possible, and that does need to be studied, and are there significant differences? Because again, for um, trans men, it can be very dysphoric to come off testosterone, particularly for a period of several months. And so, um, you know, could there be a method where they do not need to come off testosterone prior to the stimulation? Um, the jury's still out, we don't know, but we're hoping to add more data in that area. Um, uh, this is kind of hot off the press. We're presenting this um, uh, uh, this month, actually, as a follow-up on our transgender survey, uh, a transgender study. Um, we've basically, since 2019, doubled our experience with transgender men coming in for either fertility preservation or embryo creation. So the number of cycles um, in our experience with this has really increased over the last few years. And what this is showing you, it's a, it's a little uh, murky, and apologies for that, um, is that um, men who had been on testosterone for prolonged periods of time, um, more than five years or less than five years had actually very similar egg yields. And also the amount of uh, medications that we needed to use to stimulate their ovaries were quite sim similar if they had no testosterone exposure or had had uh, longer periods of testosterone ex exposure. So this is really trying to understand, you know, what is the impact of a testosterone use or long-term testosterone use? And we are learning that there may not be a significant impact. Um, of that on uh, recovery rates of eggs and likely also not on egg quality. But that is a, uh, something that we still have to do a lot more research on to get more definitive information. Um, I think it's important to note that, of course, we also treat non-binary individuals. They may or may not be infertile, and their success rates would be expected to be similar to those who are cisgender, particularly if they've not gone through any, um, any uh, gender-affirming treatment. So um, 
so wrapping up here, um, you know, you, you may wonder what happens when a patient comes in for consultation. Um, so when you refer a patient, they first speak to our centralized booking center. Um, and I should mention our um, one of our uh, favorite employees, Rhonda Gannon, um, is retiring this month. Um, so for the Ask Rhonda and all that good stuff that the patients are used to experiencing, um, it'll be Rhonda's team who will be replacing her and she'll be thoroughly missed. Um, when a patient schedules a consultation, they do have a one hour consultation with a fertility specialist like myself. And then they do um, some initial testing, typically ultrasound and blood work. And we do have, you know, we're a comprehensive center. So we do have social work, nutrition counseling, acupuncture services, um, you know, behavioral health. So um, we are able to meet those needs for our patients as well in center. Treatment timelines, usually it takes maybe about a month to get in for an appointment, um, a, a month to do testing, a month for insurance review, um, and then a month for treatment, generally speaking. Um, if somebody is interested in surrogacy, that is a longer process. So six to nine with COVID, maybe even six to 12 months. Um, Thank you so much for joining in today. I mean, I think that what I'd like to share with you is that, um, you know, it, it takes time to, uh, to build an LGBTQ plus friendly practice. We've certainly worked a lot on, on that uh, at Boston IVF to, to provide a world-class experience. Um, and there are excellent resources available um, for this. You know, luckily being in our New England area, we have Fenway Health, we have a family quality council that we can look to for online resources, and Open Door is a great training program from the Family uh, Quality Council. But, you know, if you want to be friendly to this community and, you know, showing it on your website, um, signage, educating your staff, making sure all your restrooms are all gender, and making sure it's reflected through your documentation. Um, staff training is important too, and so we're working very hard on that too, to make sure that, that everybody feels welcome. So I hope that we have met our objectives today. Um, thank you again, and uh, here are my references, and happy to provide um, guidance uh, going forward uh, for any patients I can help you with. Um, and I think we have time a few minutes anyways, uh, maybe about five minutes for questions. Thank you, great presentation. Um, we're gonna now start answering some questions from today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Dr. Resikova, our first question is, how much sperm should a transgender person freeze prior to transitioning? Okay. Um, that's a that's a complex question. I mean, I think it's something that would want it that, that they would want to evaluate with a, a reproductive specialist, potentially a urologist or potentially a, an REI, um, because it's situation dependent and kind of depends on what their family building goals are. Are they thinking about IUI? Or are they thinking about IVF? Um, is this um, an, uh, at a very early point in their journey, potentially in their adolescent years? Um, in general, I tend to follow the ASCO guidelines for this. So for clinical oncology, they usually recommend freezing about 10 vials of sperm. Um, but of course, that varies on their reproductive goals, their sort of desired partner or current partner status, and, um, and then also what their treatment goals are. But about 10 vials is, is a really good kind of jumping off point. Great. Our next question is, what are options for patients with mass health? Mm -hmm. um, so mass health is does not cover fertility services or fertility workup. So um, there's definitely excellent treatment options available, but you know financially can be more complex. Um, this is you know huge huge opportunity for um, the OBGYN or PCP to sort of initiate some of the workup. So um, if you want to phone a friend, uh, feel free to phone me, and uh, I can give you some some more insight into what kind of testing may be helpful or beneficial um, before initiating a fertility journey. Um, but you know we can also provide um, transparent self pay pricing for for individuals who are interested in treatment, um, and then you know we can also customize uh, the workup, you know, uh, based on, you know, financial need. And so that is important. We also have some discount programs available for our center uh, for individuals who qualify um, for reduced rates. So, you know, we don't want any, anybody to feel like, that, you know, it's inaccessible. Um, and then the other option too, is there are fertility grants available. Um, and lastly, um, 
I have had patients, you know, change jobs so that they can gain uh, insurance coverage by working for a Massachusetts company with great fertility benefits, um, or a tech company, or you know, start delivering for Amazon. Gosh, they can, you know, there's there's lots of different options where um, patients can start to gain access to the reproductive coverage that they deserve. Great, and I think this is our last question. Mm -hmm. In a same-sex relationship. Do you test both females at the beginning during the initial workup? Mm -hmm. I usually offer testing for both um, for both partners before getting started. Um, in most cases, I find that um, couples have like a really strong understanding of who would like to participate in treatment and who would like to carry the pregnancy. But I always offer fertility testing for both because even if they think um, one partner would like to initiate the process first, and then there's a reproductive concern that's identified in the other partner, then we we may have the opportunity to sort of intervene or potentially even um, change sequence or order. So I do offer the fertility workup for both partners. Most people, you know, want know if they want to do it or don't want to do it, but it's important to know that they have the option because it can provide us some guidance um, for, for future planning. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Resikova, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, LGBTQIA plus family building. If you have any other questions, please contact myself, Alyssa Cooper, at my email, ecooper at bostonivf.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete the survey and provide your feedback to help with future educational webinars. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Boston IVF and Dr. Resikova, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone.